Thanks, and we can put this on our school's YouTube channel. Uh, yes, of course. Right. Did that start? Yes, there it goes. <coughs> yeah, um, and for those of you who are with us in person, we're all welcome to head over to the Marquee Wellington for a few drinks afterwards, um, where we can continue conversations with Jason. Um, yeah, as always, the Wednesday seminars are a really great opportunity for our um, staff members and PhD students and undergrads um, of all varieties to come together um, and share in some of the exciting research going on in archaeology, both within our department and beyond it. Um, so our speaker today, like I said, is Jason Wood, who's a director of Heritage Consulting Services. Um, he's a former chairman at the National Trust's archaeology panel, um, has a wide experience in heritage projects, um, and is widely published, and is really a, a very experienced figure um, in heritage and archaeology. So, I have him. Um, so without further ado, uh, please welcome Jason Wood. Yeah. Brandon, thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everyone here and at home. Um, no prizes for guessing where this slide was taken. Does anyone, has anyone actually lived in Filbert Village? No. I'm shaking heads. OK, well, it's now a student hall of residence for the university, of course, uh, just to the uh, next to um, the new stadium. Football and archaeology. Two subjects rarely thought of together, yet surely as an industry, uh, football must have, by definition, an industrial archaeology. I was expecting Marilyn Palmer to shout hooray at this point, but she's not here, sadly. But I want to explore the archaeology of football through two case studies. Um, one in Bradford at Park Avenue, that's the former football ground of Bradford Park Avenue, founded in 1907, but went out of existence in the 1970s. Um, where archaeology uh, contributed, along with an art project, to enhancing the legacy of that site. And then the second case study is in York, the home of York City foot, uh, Football Club, Boovem Crescent, where we're in the process of creating uh, a, a legacy. Um, there's someone waiting in there's the lobby. Say, Julian, we'll just let anyone in. So you can all the Lovely. So starting with Bradford Park Avenue. So here's the, the football ground and the cricket ground. This is quite a common feature in Yorkshire uh, to combine um, football, uh, cricket and, and um, bowling uh, in a sort of multi-sports multi complex. So long before the current uh, multi-sport complexes were built from the 1960s and 70s, this was an Edwardian uh, precursor. The football ground is at the bottom uh, of the slide here. Uh, cricket ground, obviously here. And the main stand, designed by the engineer Archibald Leach, quite famous for his um, sporting architectural uh, accomplishments, the main stand served both the football and the cricket ground. It looked both ways. Now, the site, as I mentioned, went out of existence in the 1970s when the club um, failed to uh, um, uh, be up, let back into the league, having been relegated. Um, and the ground was just left to ruin in the extraordinary time capsule of social history of, of Bradford. Uh, the terraces were left abandoned, seats were removed, pylons brought down and anything salvaged from them that could be salvaged taken away. Grass grew, the roof slates came off. And then yet there are little aspects of the grounds, history and heritage surviving. So here's a, a, a turnstile entombed in a now blocked off uh, wall with the original price entrance price of five shillings still painted on the outside of the ground. And then gradually nature took over. Um, so I call this the anchor watt of football because the trees have now stand on the terraces where the fans once stood. 
And it's always been a site that intrigued me. I, my mother was from Bradford and we used to go on family trips over there and drive past this decaying ruin. Interestingly, as you can see from this Google uh, Air photograph, the, the, the woodland on, on the left hand side here uh, is where the cop or Horton Park end, the home end was. And Google Maps actually has this as, as an area of woodland. It doesn't recognize it as a former football ground. So it hasn't taken that long before um, tree growth and people's memories uh, have um, combined to uh, make this site a forgotten football ground. The cricket ground you see at the base of the slide uh, is still off is still in operation and this blue roofed building here is was built as an indoor cricket um, training center now a private gym but uh, what you can see as i said uh, the archaeology of, of anchor watt springs to mind so as it's a ruin as it looked a bit like an archaeological site why not try the, the usual archaeological techniques uh, to um, try to unravel its past so the first thing we did was a geophysical survey and I hope you can see here that although this is just a green area of land what the geophysics has picked out are the original white markings of the pitch so here's the penalty area the D six yard box goal posts center circle halfway line etc uh, now this we weren't expecting. Um, we we used the geophysical survey team at Bradford University down the road, and they were quite uh, surprised to see the white line showing up as a geophysical anomaly. And it's down to the fact that a constant liming of the soil changes the the, comp, the the nature of that soil, and that the lime leaches into the ground. So although you don't see it today, it's buried as a as a mark in the ground, and it's picked up using resistivity. Um, we also engaged uh, with um, the local fan base. The club was re refounded in the early 21st century and uh, plays at a different ground now. Um, but some of the older fans remember Park Avenue from when they were children. And we got as many of these characters together as possible to help sweep the terraces um, and to undertake some of the excavations, which we chose to do at the home end around the goal area. Now you've all heard, heard of goal of uh, goal line technology. Well this is goal line archaeology. Um, and um, what you're looking at at bottom right is is one of the goalpost holes from the goal uh, from the time when the post was probably extracted in the 1970s. And in that hole remarkably were 13 plastic teacups, uh, nothing else. Um, so I like to think, I mean, if this was the Bronze Age, then you'd be talking place deposits, wouldn't you? You'd be talking some sort of ritualistic um, function. Uh, this hole where the post had stood obviously meant something to somebody, enough for them to mark it using these teacups. It's also unusual as an archaeologist having excavated something to then meet someone later the same day who has a photograph, not just of himself, but of the actual object you've just excavated. So this is the very goalpost. Um, take the photograph, take on the last league game uh, just before the posts were taken away. So we'll come back to this idea of the recent past and archaeology and use of uh, oral history um, in a moment. Um, the other interesting feature we found at Park Avenue around the goal, in and around the goal, were 50 odd coins, all pre-decimal, because remember the site went out of use in the 70s, um, uh, half pennies, pennies, even a threatening bit or two. Um, First one we found is actually buried in the soil just here on the left was dated 1966, obviously an important date in the football world. If you're an Englishman, that is. Now, why all these coins? Uh, well, 
the initial thoughts when we started to find a few were, well, maybe they've been thrown at the goal at the goalkeeper, to the opposing goalkeeper, one would hope. Uh, <clears throat> but then we found more and more of them, and he can't have been that bad a goalkeeper. So uh, we were somewhat struggling. Now, and again, in an archaeological context, you'd come up with all sorts of ritualistic explanations for why these coins were here. And some of them were actually in a line, which we realised later marked the edge of the back of the net. So again, had they been placed there or had they just fallen there accidentally? Anyway, one of the volunteers in his 80s, when, when we'd mentioned these coin finds, he said, oh, that'll be the half-time collection. So we were interested, obviously, to find out what that meant. And he said, well, yeah, half time, us kids, we'd walk around the edge of the pitch with a blanket and people would throw coins from the terraces and the coins would be collected and given to our local charity. So obviously these coins have been thrown from the terraces, but had missed this particular blanket. And over the years, those coins that missed the blanket and perhaps hit the net and fell down and therefore couldn't be retrieved easily were just left. Now, would we have come up with that explanation <laughs> without that corroboration with, with the social historical fact? So that, you know, this is one of the interesting facts about this project is how it generated people's memories. It created, it, 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 which otherwise would have led, been hidden. Um, and the project resulted in a, an exhibition at the National Football Museum in Manchester, uh, where my trowel is still an exhibit. Not many archaeologists can say they have a trowel in a National Football Museum. Uh, the, the project also resulted in a, a, a book. The project was called Breaking Ground, um, and the book broke all sorts of ground in that it was shortlisted for the William Hill Sports Book of the Year. Uh, in that particular year. And, and the project, the, the publication project was actually literally crowd funded. Members of the football crowd contributed money towards its printing and received a, a complimentary copy. OK, the second uh, case study, um, Move from Crescent, home of York City since 1932. And this is a uh, a project which has been going on over the last three years uh, and is still uh, still to be completed. But I thought I'd share some of the initial thoughts and, and results. The project's called Sharing Memories, Shaping Place. And so it's basically a project to allow people to share their memories and build support for a project to help influence the shape of the redevelopment of the site. The site has been sold for housing uh, and it was important given the number of football grounds which have been lost to housing developments and other developments over the years to do something a little bit more imaginative. And the advantage of it being in York was that it was on the edge of a conservation area and therefore Historic England, who also have an office in York, were able to have a say in what that development might look like. And they engaged me to 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 pull together a project which involved, as you can see, the audiences listed here, everything from the club and the supporters trust to local residents and businesses and the fan base worldwide. Um, and of course, the, the, the stakeholder audiences like the, the, the housing developer, Persimmon, who are a York based company, um, the council planning team who were obviously 100% behind this idea and politicians and, and media. And the first pro uh, part of the project was to re a review of what has happened at other football grounds which have been redeveloped. Um, and there are a number which are good examples or are on the ball. Uh, the best example and probably unique in the world is, is the redevelopment of Highbury. That's Arsenal's former ground, um, which uh, was sympathetically converted. The two Art Deco listed stands which opposed each other on the long sides of the pitch were converted to apartments and the pitch uh, into a communal garden for the use of the residents. There's a long story behind that, but we haven't got time to go into that out, maybe in the pub later. But it's a really good example of how to engage with the fan base 
uh, and the, how the club engage with the fan base in order to achieve a better solution and a more imaginative solution. And one actually, which was much more commercially successful than it would have been if they'd just simply demolished everything and built noddy houses. Another example, which I think gets the, uh, my vote anyway, is um, the redevelopment of Ayrson Park in Middlesbrough. Uh, this is quite an early ground relocation in the mid 80s uh, and a housing development was built over the site. But as part of the project, as a part of a sort of payback for planning permission, an art project was commissioned, which the developer had to pay for. Uh, and uh, installations were placed around the housing estate to mark particular locations uh, relating to the former football ground. So the centre spot is a pair of bronze boots, just happens to be on someone's doorstep. Uh, the bronze football, it marks one of the penalty spots. There's a, an apocryphal story about um, Paul Gascoigne, uh, about a mate who lived here, uh, coming home rather worse for wear, back to his mate's house and attempting to kick this bronze football. Um, would have broken his foot, I can tell you. Um, there are many, however, sadly, many contenders for an early bath, i.e. not good examples of how to redevelop a football ground. This is Morecambe, where the only thing is a, is a plaque on the centre spot commemorating uh, the uh, club's benefactor and the thousands who visited and the few whose ashes forever remain here under a Sainsbury's car park. Alternatively, your ashes could be under a B&Q car park in Leeds, at Leeds Road, that's Huddersfield's ground. You can see the lower images of the ground there. Uh, now uh, a retail park, or they could be under um, another retail park or a Burger King even in, at Brighton, Goldstone ground, Brighton, Hove Albion's former ground. Um, these are particularly bad examples, Not even you're not even allowed to play ball games uh, on the site of Wigan, Wigan Springfield Park or N Northbridge Victoria's Victoria ground, what the oldest football ground in Britain or was. Um, Sunderland's Roker Park is now another housing estate where you can't kick a ball around, no football games allowed. Well, some some Newcastle fans would claim it never, they never did play football at Roker Park. Notice there's no relegation close. Now, you won't recognise this one, I suspect. This is Stoke City's former ground, the Victoria ground. Uh, left abandoned, demolished and left abandoned for many, many years, 25 years or so before more a new, another housing estate was, was put on it. Uh, and I particularly like this bit of graffiti which says, give us a park. Well, I doubt the graffiti artist had this particular park in mind, Victoria Park, which is now what is being built on the site. Um, but it, it tells an interesting story, and one I like to claim some some part in. Um, the the map on the on the left is is a plan of the housing estate as was laid out in the first brochure advertising the development. So if you were interested in a house, you went to the show house and you got given a brochure of what all these houses would look like, and here's a plan, and you could buy off plan basically. I happened to mention to the uh, to the guy in the sales office um, that perhaps a lot of his interest uh, in buying houses might come from Stoke City fans rather than just anyone wanting to buy a house, and therefore maybe some sort of reference of how the housing estate related to the football ground might be a good idea. And lo and behold, a year later, I go pretending to be interested in buying a house, and I'm given the plan on the right, which has useful little uh, markers like where Stanley Matthews uh, once scored a goal um, and, and where the uh, executive suite in the main stand was. And, but notice how the housing estate bears no relationship whatsoever to the earlier football ground plan. OK. But the developer saw an opportunity, a commercial opportunity to mark with it using its homespun blue plaques um, 
the uh, particular houses which happen to coincide with particular features of the ground, in this case, the uh, centre circle. And they put a premium on these houses. You actually had to pay more if your house had a blue plaque. OK. Um, the reference to squeaky bum time may require some explanation, perhaps again in the pub, but it's um, it's a reference to extra time or additional time in a football match. And additional time is what, thankfully, we were able to obtain um, at Bruven Crescent in order to develop a much better project. If the original scheme had gone ahead and a timetable had gone ahead, uh, and the reason I've put unaffordable, unaffordable housing here is because it's Persimmon, who were the developers, who were not particularly enamoured of our proposals to start with. But because we had more time to work with them, and, more, and fortunately there were delays to York City's new stadium, and then, then COVID came along. So everything got pushed back a couple of years. And in that window, we were able to convince both the planners and the developers that what we had come up with, having consulted with the fan base and, everyone, and all those other um, consultees, uh, could be delivered and with minimum extra cost to them. And one of the critical things that came out of the consultation um, was the need for something tangible, something where people could focus their memories and orientate themselves. So if you remember back to the Stoke City housing plan, you wouldn't know where you were if you were walking around those streets in relation to the football camp. So we felt it was important to be able to shape the development of the housing estate to reflect its the former use of the site and for people to have somewhere they could focus their memories and somewhere where they could sit ideally and imagine themselves back in the in the football ground. Uh, so one of the um, features, I should just go back to the last slide. This this image here is of a tunnel. OK, interestingly reflecting the club's colours in the sunlight against the wall. Um, now, this tunnel gave was underneath the popular stand. OK, and it allowed rival fans to change ends at half time. This stand was built in 1932. And the idea was, this is long before ground segregation or health and safety issues kicked in after the Bradford fire and Hillsborough. Um, but up until the 1970s, 80s, you could change ends at half time and not pay any extra. You could just walk through this tunnel so that you could always be behind the goal your team was kicking towards, okay? Now you can imagine, this is a very narrow tunnel, so you can imagine rival fans passing each other at the halfway line. <laughs> and believe me, we've, we've interviewed plenty of characters who, who remember getting into uh, uh, handbags, as some kids not known as, uh, in this tunnel uh, in, in the 1950s and 60s. So we, because of that, those that nice stories and also because the tunnel was used as an air raid shelter in the second world war for the local schools and residents it, it, it struck me as being an obvious place to focus our our, our um, memorialization of the site if you want if you will um so the pop stand because it's one of the early stands uh and, it, and this tunnel is part of it. So if I look at the cursor here, there's the tunnel there, just behind, but it's actually integral to the construction of the, of the um, concrete terracing and the back wall. And the back wall was going to be left in situ because it's the boundary or perimeter wall for this site. So the tunnel was going to be preserved in part anyway. So let's preserve it all and let's try and preserve a section through the through the stand and maybe reuse some elements from the stand in that in that um, legacy area as it's now known and if we do that at the halfway line then we provide somewhere for people to sit and people to orientate themselves so this is what we've come up with this is just a schematic drawing obviously the thing hasn't been 
constructed yet or, or the demolition hasn't started yet. But in two years time, we hope that this legacy area will be complete. Um, reusing, as I say, some of the metalwork from the stand at the back and at the sides. You reusing the picket fence, which survives in front of the stand, to create a memorial garden around the base of this feature. So somewhere tangible, somewhere to orientate, somewhere to remember, somewhere to imagine, reimagine yourself back on the site. And this was an, in an area which was never going to be built on anyway, because it was the public open space as part of the development proposal. And of course, the memorials are important. This is, these are the club memorials um, for ex-players and managers who were killed in either the First World War or the Second World War. So where were these going to go once the site was demolished? So this provides a home for these. But crucially and uniquely uh, in, in this project, um, we actually got to excavate the hallowed turf. And um, this was because we were informed by the club that up to 15 fans had been buried around the perimeter of the ground. They were so emotionally attached to this place, they wanted to be buried here. Now, this isn't, isn't a, a, a full burial. This is cremation burial, of course. So their ashes were placed in urns or, or part of their ashes were placed in a hole in the ground, and usually at the home end of the ground, um, and usually in and around the goal area. So a bit like our coins at the previous site. So in all, and no records, of course, had been kept. Nobody at the club had any notion of where these things were. The groundsmen had long retired. Um, so, and we tried geophysics, but that was too, the, the ashes were too small to be picked up using that technology. So the only way to do it was to strip back the turf and do a classic archaeological excavation to try and locate where the disturbance in the ground and these ashes were. So here's the uh, home end of the ground and the excavation trench you can see in the middle of the slide. And um, here's one of these burials. Now, in this case, although the club didn't keep records, family members did. So the club contacted family of people they knew had been buried there and they provided what evidence they had as to where their loved one was buried. And this was the first um, cremation we, we excavated. Um, in fact, I did it prior to the main excavation just to test how deep they were so we knew how much machining to do. Um, so when the volunteers all arrived, and they were volunteers again from the fan base who'd come to help excavate their forebears, the first lady to walk up to me was called Linda. And I said, hello, I'm Jason, I'm the archaeologist. She says, I'm Linda, I've come for my sister. I said, oh, OK, and then and your sister's name was Dawn. OK, uh, and so she got the photograph out on the top left here, showing exactly where Dawn ashes were buried. Now, I don't know if you can see, but it's an oval casket uh, in, uh, and actually uh, biodegradable as well. Um, but what was crucial is that we knew the photograph is actually shows the grandstand behind as well. So we were able to, sh to work out exactly from the steps on the grandstand and the stanchions and the concrete joints where we were. And it so happened I'd excavated Dawn a couple of days before. So I pulled back this tarpaulin and Linda looked down at her sister's ashes. And she just stood there for a while and then said, you don't expect to be digging up your sister's ashes 15 years after you buried her. I said no. And as an archaeologist, you don't expect to be talking to the sister of the person <laughs> whose ashes you just excavated. So it was all a bit weird, uh, but emo emotional in a good way, because she said, right, let's crack on. And she volunteered for three days and was the best digger I've known for a long time, in including Neil Redfern, the director of the Council for British Archaeology, 
whose office is just down the road, came to volunteer as well and worked with Linda all day and said, I don't believe this woman's never dug before. So, and she helped find other people who her sister would have known because Dawn apparently and her friends were diehard York City fans. Um, so we found about 11 uh, sets of ashes altogether, um, including a couple which were actually in caskets. In other words, the whole body had been cremated and placed in the ground. Um, and uh, the groundsman volunteered to make some little coffins or wooden caskets to put the ashes in. So when we reinter these ashes uh, in the memorial garden, they will have a nameplate on the box. And the box boxes, the wooden boxes are made out of seats from the main stand being reclaimed. OK. Um, just as an aside issue to finding the the um, the, 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 the caskets, uh, what we didn't expect to find, if you remember back to the Bradford Park Avenue geophysics, the uh, the white lines showing up as a resistivity line. Here we actually found the evidence of the white lines still in the ground. In other words, that that anomaly which the geophysics was picking up actually as an archaeological feature. So you can see here um, this white line. Yeah. This one. And the one, can you see that shoe there and this shoe here? Those are the latest set of goalpost holes. OK, so the white line associated with these, because these were dated probably 1990s, uh, hasn't leached down deep enough. OK, the, the, the older the white line, the deeper the leaching. OK. So what we were able to establish uh, is that this white line here relates to another set of goalpost holes slip, set back from the, the last set. And this white line relates to the original uh, edge of the pitch and where the original goalposts were set. So the pitch has got narrower over time. Possibly to accommodate a, a running track around the perimeter uh, and possibly moved slightly over over time as well to accommodate changes in the construction of the main stand. So we've ended up with three sets of goalpost holes and three touch lines. So they literally move the goalposts. Here's the part of the excavation showing you can see how vivid those white lines are as they come up. A lot of other features you, you can see the sand and the grit are drainage features, um, but the white lines are the are the original um, touch lines. Now here you can see on the bottom slide, there's the leaching. Can you see? So that that's where the white line has been consistently over time. And this one, and that relates to the latest pitch. OK, because that the leaching starts at the turf level. All right, but it only went down to about here, so you don't see it in plan. However, this one you see in plan, but not in section. Because this one is earlier. And of course, what's happened, so you don't see the leaching in section because it's the area has been re-turfed periodically, particularly in a gold mouth area. You're going to get a lot of churn of the soil and the turf will wear away. So every season, the, the groundsman would relay the turf. And here are the turf lines. Just like a Roman rampart. Yeah, it's all the turf lines you see if you're excavating a section for a Roman rampart. Here they are in a, 19, in a, in a 20th century context. And just to demonstrate the moving of the goalposts, so the, the slide on the left is the original white line here and the original goalpost. The middle line with its goalposts, so 1950s, we think, post-war anyway, and then the later set in the 1990s on the right. And there are the goalposts. The one on the left being the earlier one, 1930s goalposts were square. Okay, so that's a square concrete shoe. 
into which it was set and look at the amount of earth above that level. That's the buildup of earth over time. Between the 1930s and today. Uh, and well, and more because we've taken off the, the topsoil as well. So that's the that's the natural buildup of earth or and or it's the returfing, which has gradually risen, raised the, the ground level. The secondary set of post holes from the 1950s were elliptical as they are today. But they were probably wooden. Not aluminium like they are today or plastic. So elliptical. So the, the, the form of the hole, it has a, a lining of wood which shows the elliptical shape. Uh, we also had hooks still in the ground, which originally held the net behind the goalpost. And even a bit of the net, which was pulled out of the ground and they just left it ripped off or they, or they cut it off. And that, that hook there is probably from the back of the original wooden post. So the net was attached to the hook, the rear of the post. OK. okay. Um, so I mentioned earlier how important it was to influence the housing developer and how and to shape the development. So just to pinpoint a few points here, there's our popular stand terrace and tunnel, which will be flanked by this memorial garden. So it's attached to this boundary wall in red and in front of the public open space with the center circle marked out. And I'll come back to this flagpole in a minute. But look at how, how the design or layout has changed over the years. This has been a long running ambition of the club to relocate. It's taken them 20 odd years. And so the original plans were this one in 2002, bearing no relation whatsoever to the football ground and cramming more properties on uh, units onto the site than perhaps uh, was necessary. 2018, when our project began, it didn't stop Persimmon rushing out a, a development plan before they'd heard what we had to say. Um, and this plan showed some public open space, but again, no relationship to the former ground and too many properties, one could argue. But by 2020, two years of our project and two years of haggling with planners and, and the developer and the club, who obviously had a vested interest in the outcome of this as well, we end up with the plan we've now got, which is aligned on the orientation of the football ground, creating public open space in the middle, uh, fewer units um, and the, these legacy features built in. The five minute flag. Another unique feature of Booth and Crescent. Um, there was a flagpole flying the York City flag at the corner of the ground and it was lowered when there was five minutes to go before the end of the game. This was at a time in the 1930s when there was no clock at the stadium and most people didn't have wristwatches. So the only way to know how much time there was before the end of the game or whether you need, you're going to miss your bus home or train home was to watch the flag. So the flag would stay up until five minutes before the end of the game and then come down. So that is why We've, and this was again through consultation, people remembered this. So we thought, well, let's have a flag, let's have the flagpole. Let's have it permanently on the site with the flag permanently flying as a symbolic reminder, if you like, of the allegiance of fans to this place. And because housing developers usually have a flagpole outside their um, uh, show houses, we could even repurpose one that was already there. So no extra cost to anyone. And yet, you know, something nice about leaving a permanent symbolic reminder of the site flying over the housing estate. OK, we're just going to close with a few uh, um, slides illustrating, I think, people's emotional attachment to this place. Um, uh, and of course, the conflict between the fan base and the club trying to maximize profits from selling bits of memorabilia. Uh, this is an ongoing subject, so um, I don't have the full story, but I call it reliquary because I think because people associate football grounds and often use these quasi-religious terms, hallowed turf, I use myself. 
cathedrals of sport, etc. Reliquary are the artifacts which people cherish and want to hold on to. It's, an, it's important that they're authentic. OK, and so when football grounds close, there's usually an option of memorabilia because clubs don't tend to cherish their history, but the fan base does. So there's a, usually a bit of a rush on to acquire bits of heritage or heritat, you could argue. Uh, the club, however, did realise the commercial value of the turnstiles. These are particularly early ones, so they were sold at auction. Um, however, seats, if you could buy your own seat, if you were a season ticket holder, but by the end, they were just giving them away. Help, help yourself, you know, up for grabs. Uh, you could also walk away with some nice signs. I mean, God knows what people do with these things, but, you know, good luck to them. Uh, this woman produced, walked away with a photograph of her son. During COVID, a lot of football grounds were closed, of course, and so fans volunteered to have their photograph taken so they could make a cardboard cutout of themselves and put it on their seat so that it looked like there was a crowd of people. Uh, and they were giving these away, of course, uh, but this, this lady came. His son said, go and get my photograph. I want my photograph. So that explains that. Uh, and the final example... Would you believe someone actually bought the gents urinal from the back of the of the cop? Uh, what you don't see in this photograph is this chap's wife <laughs> with her head in her hands. <laughs> uh, almost mouthing the words, are you taking the piss? Anyway, it didn't fit into his car, so he had to come back later with a lorry. Um, OK, place attachment. So I think what this project shows is how and on the last few slides clearly shows how keenly valued and cherished places like this are. Um, they're repositories of memory. They convey intense senses of identity and belonging. And they certainly stir people's hearts and minds and evoke strong and enduring social responses. And this, I would argue, is especially true when football grounds are relocated as opposed to just redeveloped and the fan base is dislocated. Um, so the project is, is, is offering us an, um, an opportunity, I, I believe, to test imaginative ways of involving people for whom this, this ground holds great meaning and to explore why they value the site and how it should be memorialised. Um, if you want to read up on this project, then uh, there's an issue of British Archaeology um, from August 21. Uh, where I go into more detail about the project and um, uh, and the people's re um, reactions to it. Uh, one person's reaction to it was simply to leave an RIP card on the gates on the last day after the last game. Thank you for the memories. Lots of love. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jason, for that. And uh, be assured that your wealth of football puns was not lost on, on us. Yes. Least, on me. It, was, it was pretty impressive, I think. Um, uh, I recognize we're a pretty small audience, but what I will do is um, open us up to question anyway. So uh, you know how this works. If you're at home, um, you can either raise your hand um, or you can type your question to the chat. Um, and we're also, of course, accepting questions from our in-house audience. Do you have, yeah, go on. Uh, was, it, was there any pushback with the burials being like excavated and relocated? Did anybody in the community like was against it? No. Um, I think uh, if the club had gone ahead without consultation with the fans, there might have been. But in fact, there's a legal requirement for uh, any cremations, even in an unconsecrated ground, uh, if they're whole and in a cast. <laughs> or they can be identified as belonging to a particular individual. So in the case of the caskets, we knew because relatives had told us where they were buried. And indeed, in the case of the casket, which had decomposed, we had sufficient evidence and, uh, from the family. So where we could identify an individual and where the ashes are a complete um, relic, if you like, of the, of, of, of the person, then you need a permit 
to exhume from the Ministry of Justice. Uh, and then you, the, 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 the remains, once you've got the permit, have to be reburied within a certain number of months. Now, we've negotiated a longer time frame because of the housing development taking two years. So, and because they're staying on site in a memorial garden, not far removed from where they were buried, that is deemed to be okay. So, yeah, if we'd have gone ahead without the Ministry of Justice's compliance, then we would have been causing a problem. But we engaged with the fan base, told them what they were, we were doing, uh, and those and the names of the individuals we had and the locations came from the families. So, you know, because the club had, hadn't kept any records or had lost them. So yes, that was a good question, but yeah, it would no 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 comeback. The only issue might have been, you know, if the, the relatives didn't want the ashes reinterred on the site. But given that their loved one wanted to be buried there, that seemed unlikely. Hmm. Looks like we have a question from James. And do you have a question also, Ian? Yeah, yeah. Everyone. Okay, we'll get James's uh, sorry, Simon's first and then. Thank you. Um Thanks for that, Jason. It's a good uh, trip down uh, uh, memory lane for you there with a uh, reference to uh, Roman ramparts. Uh, yes, yes. Very interesting uh, series of projects you've got here. Um, fantastic uh, outreach impacts uh, in archaeological engagement. Mm -hmm. It's really stonking stuff. Uh, one of the things I'm a bit uh, interested to, to know is do you have plans for kind of long term follow up on any of the projects of how people continue to engage with the ways in which um, you've actually managed to, you know, um, help yeah. celebrate these lost football grounds uh, uh, in the modern landscape uh, or, or and perhaps also the way people continue to interact with their the memorabilia, um, because uh, there, of course I've been slightly involved in some analogous things, I guess, uh, with, for example, so-called trench art and so forth from yes. military context. Yeah. What about the kind of longer term? Sure. Well, the um, plan for Bootham Crescent is for the memorial area to be leased back to the football club um, for ongoing maintenance and, and, and use so that future burials can take place um on the site for those fans who you know might wish there to be buried there in the future um there will be a um a small board made up of the supporters trust and the club who will maintain that that area and one of the ideas in discussion is once that handover has taken place and the, the stand if you like has been dressed and the memorial garden laid out is what you could do with that wall which will be flanking the memorial area and was the original perimeter wall for the site. That is a, 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 a blank canvas for all sorts of potential um, uh, for photography or arts works or whatever to commemorate the site. We've also commissioned um, Bradford University to do a laser survey, 3D laser survey of the entire ground. Cool. Um, and that will be um, then turned into an uh, augmented reality app for your phone. So you'll be able to sit on the terrace, um, connect to, through an app and visualise the site as it was from the position you're sat. Um, uh, also, we, we thought about things like people's season ticket seat, if they want to imagine where they, you know, where that was, so we could position them back in their seats so they could panoramically view the site again. So all, all sorts of interesting technologies down the line which could be applied, but I'm not personally involved in, in that. What I've tried to do is engage with as many of the technologies we have available, whether it be laser survey or geophysics, so that we have that data set to be able to use that in the future. Um, in terms of um, ongoing projects, but well, the Bradford Park Avenue project resulted in the book I mentioned mm -hmm. just a few years ago. So that, if you like, is part of the legacy of the of that project. Um, uh, although it had a rather, uh, sadly, a short run of only 500, which have now sold out. Um, if we won the, the William Hill Sports Book of the Year, however, we, we had the presses ready to roll. Um, but so that's one aspect of the legacy. The site isn't under any threat. It, it has a covenant on it. It can only be used for sport or leisure. And in fact, they've built cricket nets on the pitch now. And the cricket ground is being brought back into use. So Yorkshire and potentially England might play there 
in the future, as an alternative to he Headingley. Um, in terms of the uh, Boom Crescent project, in terms of um, output, uh, there's a book being planned uh, about the project. Um, and, the, uh, and throughout the three years I've been involved, we've made a series of documentary films, which you can view on Historic England's YouTube channel. If you type Boom Crescent into Historic England's U uh, YouTube channel, you'll, you'll, there are seven five minute videos. Um, recording the project and people's views and attitudes to it. And there's a further three videos to be done to mark the completion of the project. So quite a lot going on still in terms of output. Memorabilia, obviously we can illustrate people's memorabilia in, in published forms. Very difficult to prize these objects out of people, however. Um, but maybe a temporary exhibition at some point where people can bring their memorabilia to show people and explain their interest in it. Um, but not, I don't see a permanent sort of museum display anywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, I think people like, like to own these things and they like to just cherish them um, and share the knowledge they have of them. When we, we had an open day at Bradford um, and people turned up with all sorts of things, which they shouldn't really have had, like the minute book for the club from the late 19th century, <laughs> things they'd stolen from the, the place when it was a ruin for so many years. You know, they just helped themselves to nameplates off doors. Um, someone even had uh, the, the, the club shield, which they got off the gable end of one of the stands. And this guy had, guy had kept it in his garage for, for 30 years and his wife had left him, he told us. <laughs> so, so uh, he cherished it more than his wife, which, you know, was a little sad, but... Oh, that's football. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, I hope that answers your questions. It does indeed. Thanks, Jason. Great projects. Cheers. And from you. Oh, thanks, Jason. It was a real <laughs> trip of, through nostalgia there for me. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a really sad person because my two passions in life are archaeology and, um, and football. Oh. And uh, I've got, um, I, my wife was a big Sunderland supporter and when Roker Park went, um, and they had a, an auction, they were selling off all the turnstiles and we, we tried to bid for one, but we didn't get it. I don't know where we would have put it. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, when the Tigers uh, closed down their, their stand, which is a rugby ground, um, I actually asked the groundsman if I could have our old seat and, uh, uh, and he hoiked it out with a big hammer and um, uh, gave it to me. And when I got it home, I realised we'd been sitting in the wrong seat for the last 20 years, which is <laughs> <thing that's, laughs> there we are. Um, and, and the third, third thing, I think, really, is, is a great sense of identity and community um, uh, that, that you get from belonging or the football club belonging to you. Uh, and it's very proprietorial. And, um, and it has got a lot of um, parallels in archaeology. Uh, to look at it um, and um, at the moment down at the uh, uh, King Power Stadium they're redeveloping it and my daughter's actually involved in the <laughs> consultation for, for the, the planning um, but but they've just put in this amazing um, uh, site this memorial garden to the chairman who died in the helicopter accident yeah. uh, a few years ago and 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 it, they've got to squeeze it round there because they've got limited amount of space, um, and and so they've now got three sort of memorial gardens there. One is the original one, which is stuck over by the wharf, um, and and then they've got this new memorial garden, which they spent a lot of money on, but it's going to be right in the way of the new arena and the hotel and everything else. And then they've just put up this statue this last month uh, of the chairman, um, you know, at the front of the, the stand. So, yeah. so memorial is is a big thing in football it is, isn't it? Yeah. And, and big thing in archaeology and you know and so uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how they do that um there's just a few observations really just locally uh, sure but no, 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 at all. not at all no um i think the, the the thing i took away from both projects but particularly the first one at bradford which we did in 2013 and 15 so some time ago now um, was the, um, you know, the archaeology dig, limited though it was to just a few days work with the intention of finding a goalpost hole just to sort of help position ourselves. 
in real because once you've got one goal post hole you can recreate the entire ground you see because everything is standard distances um so uh the archaeology was was you know went as far as it could but without the that input from the, the volunteers particularly the older generation who remembered going there as children without their knowledge and without their insights as to what we were finding whether it's the, the coins and, and even a nappy pin would you believe we found a nappy pin by one of the goal posts um and uh, this lady turned up on site on the same day in a tears um and we, we asked her what the problem was and she said well i haven't been back here since my father died um and his cortege stopped outside the ground for a minute and we said oh was your father you know was he a director or no no look, uh, he was a, he was the goalkeeper he was called Chick Far, and he was the goalkeeper between the wars. So between the sticks and between the wars, should have been called Chuck Far, really. Um, anyway, Chick Far was his name, and um, he, he we played for about 15 years. On a, one notable occasion, uh, she started telling us this story. She said, well, you've heard about the nappy pins? And we said, no. <laughs> And then he said, well, yeah, during the first half, his, his, his trousers fell down, his elastic went. And the, 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 you know, the uh, guys from the bench had to come on and, and, and they had to put his trousers back on. He couldn't take them off till half time. So they pinned him up with nappy pins down the side of his shorts to save his modesty. And of course, everyone was laughing like crazy from the cop behind. And so the next home game, he got showered by nappy pins. What? And even, even and she brought a box with her. She said, these are all the nappy pins that got sent to him through the post. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, and then we found this nappy pin in the, in the, on the excavation. Now, how would we have explained that without that story? You know, we might have said, oh, it was fixing the net with a hole in the net or something. Or, you know, how else would we have come up with that? But it... But without the excavation, we wouldn't have had that story become knowledgeable, would we? She wouldn't have come to the site. She only came to the site because she heard there was a dig. So she came to the site, the dig was happening, she tells us this story, and the two things come together to make the complete picture. So I've always been interested in how much, how or how little archaeology really tells us about the past. And this is one way of testing it, when you actually know what you, you're going to find, but you can't explain some of the the objects we found unless you have the social history to go with it. So that's yeah. what that's why it was important to do. Uh, yeah, you know. I'm a great believer in audio histories. You know, to yes. illustrate the recent past. Uh, yes, we've just, yes. We've just done a project in Greyfriars on the the legal Leicester, and we've got about 25 solicitors, barristers, judges. Um, yeah. giving their views and their, their yeah. memories. So that's yeah. going to go together in a book and um, and describe it as, as a walk yeah. around the Grey Friars. Brilliant. So yeah, well, that's, that's coming this summer. <laughs> the, vid the videos I mentioned on Historic England's YouTube channel, they include a lot of interviews with people and we you know with their memories, particularly a lady in her 90s whose father was one of the founding directors and she remembers the, the ground even before Boogham Crescent. So, uh, and she's a gem, she's an absolute gem. So yeah, have a listen to those. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that was brilliant. Uh, that takes us up to our hour already. Okay. So we had a, a nice little chat there. Um, if we have more in-house questions, I'm sure we can continue the conversation uh, at the Mocky Weddington. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I think that last conversation really drives home that point. There's a kind of humidity of what archaeology can't show us. And I think you illustrated that really nicely. Um, and also it was, it was just quite a bit of fun. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Um, we really appreciate you coming down. Um, can we have one final round of applause for our speaker, please? And take care, guys. <laughs>